Hey, hey. 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 Anybody need any new friends during 60 studies? Yeah. yeah. Anybody get a date? <laughs> hey, we're just, we're just here to help, man. Whatever we do. We love people. So we do. So tonight, here's what we're doing. Uh, we're jumping into uh, an amazing, amazing journey through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Now I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking we've already heard this stuff because you attend a different location. Well, Becker always runs just a little bit behind. And with Christmas and with all of Christmas, <laughs> with Easter, Christmas, Easter, whatever. It's all about Jesus anyway. With Easter, what we did is we had to push the dot just a little bit. But I promise you that when you hear a message like this, whether it be your first time tonight or whether it be your second, third, or fourth, God is going to reveal something amazing to you, all right? And so what I want to do is I want to go ahead and I want to stop, I want to slow down, I want to take a minute to pray, and then we're going to dive into 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles tonight. I told you we're going for four books tonight. This is going to be great. Let's pray. Jesus, first and foremost, again, what an incredible opportunity to have on a Wednesday night. We know that this moment is extremely special. We know that every time we are in a gathering together, we know that there's miracles that happen and there's lives that are changed. And so we look forward to seeing what it is that you're going to do tonight. And we're just curious to know what your next step is. And I pray that as we continue to study your word, our lives be transformed by the minute of prayer. All God's people said, Amen. 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 So let me ask you a question. How many of you honestly, be honest, some people are not being too honest when I ask this question, I want, honestly, how many of you really enjoy watching uh, shows about royalty? Anybody in the room who likes shows about royalty? My wife is a royalty fiend. Like, there are times when I will be sitting in the living room and she will be watching a different show in the bedroom, and it is some kind of royal family that she's listening to, right? But here's the kicker. My wife doesn't read books at all. But she will listen to a show about royalty in a completely different language and read all of the subtitles. And I'm like, babe, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm just watching this amazing show. And I'm like, can you understand anything they're saying? I'm like, what is going on? And she's in there reading all of the subtitles to this royal show. Well, one of the scenes in a lot of these different royal shows is when the king is dying. And many times in these shows what happens is the king now is gathering the heir together to take the throne. When we get into 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, here's what we're studying. We're studying a moment when King David, we talked about him a couple weeks ago, you remember talking about King David a little bit? We're studying the moment when King David now is on his deathbed. And what he does is he, call, he calls in his son and he says, in just a few minutes, this entire kingdom is going to be turned over to you. Are you ready for this? Because the people here are amazing. They're precious. This kingdom has been given us by God. The thing that I love about King David was he was passionate about people. You ever meet somebody who's passionate about people? You get around them, you can just tell they're real, right? Yeah. King David was passionate about people. And his kingdom also loved him because of that. I wonder what it would look like. I wonder what it would look like if, if we just stayed passionate every single day in our city about the people that are there. What would it be like when you encounter someone at the gas station and, and just give them a big old smile? What would it be like if the people that don't expect a hug, you walk up to them and you just got me a little funny? Walked into a business this afternoon to see a friend of mine. And the receptionist came to the door because the door was locked. And so I'm peeking in the door just like this. And she opens it up and she goes, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm passing that. It's really good to see you. And I said, I'm here to see so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, they had heard me, so they came around the corner and I gave so-and-so a big hug. I looked at the receptionist. She kind of standing there smiling at me. I said, get over here. Never met her in my life. Come here. Gave her a hug. Lit up like a Christmas tree. Can we be passionate about people in this community where they know that we genuinely care about who they are? That was King David. And so King David is getting ready now to give this to his son. And 
In 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, listen to what David says. He says, I am going where everyone on earth must go someday. He was talking about the afterlife. And he said, take courage, and I love how he says this to Solomon. Be a man. Take courage and be a man. From one man's man to another man, be a man. Fathers in this room, sometimes it's all right to pull your kids aside, pull your sons aside and say, hey guys, be a man. Be who God's called you to be. What was he saying to Solomon? He said this, he said, be strong. That's what it means, be a man, be a king, be strong. Be courageous. Step up when others step back. Listen to God, and we all know that it's important to take minutes and moments of our days and listening to the Father speaking to us. Amen, somebody. Amen. Listen to God, and then he says this, to be what God has called you to be. You know, it's all right. It's, it's all right to tell your kids, hey, you know what? I know that all of us are different, but you just be who God's called you to be. I remember almost every day that my dad drove me to uh, school in the morning. Before I got out, he would look at me and he'd say this. He'd say, remember who you are. Remember, I'm, I'm not just Tim Wilson's son. I'm a child of the Most High God, the King of Kings. Remember who you are. And then David goes on and he says this. He says, observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all of his ways. Keep the decrees, the commands, the regulations, and the laws written in the law of Moses so that you'll be successful in all you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made you. He told me, if your descendants live as they should and follow me faithfully with all of their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Amen. And here's what happened. It's at that moment that David took his last breath. And this set off 40 kings of Israel that we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about. Tonight. Let me give you a little bit of background on what 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles all about. Here it is. Though much of the stories are the same between 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Kings tells a more political story, while Chronicles actually tells more of a priestly story of Israel. There are books 11, 12, 13, 14 of 66 books in the Bible. The author is known as the prophet Jeremiah, who wrote Kings, and the prophet Ezra, who wrote the book of Chronicles. Here's the kind of literature that First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles tell us. First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles tell the story of twenty kings of Israel, nineteen kings of Judah, and one queen of Judah. So there you are, ladies, in the house. There was a queen of Judah. It's a good day because we know that women have wisdom. Amen, somebody. And all the ladies in the room say, "Come on." Come on. There you go. I like it. So here's what we're gonna do, right? We're not going to spend a whole lot of time in 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and here's the reason why. If you read 2 Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles basically is just a recap and a summary of everything that happened from 2nd Samuel all the way through 1st and 2nd Kings. And so it's really the same story over and over and over again. However, I want us to take a really important piece from 1st and 2nd Chronicles tonight. And here's what 1st and 2nd Chronicles really does. It talks about during a time when many wondered if God was ever going to fulfill his promises. The Chronicle retold the story of their collective past in order to rekindle their hope for their future. That's why 1st and 2nd Chronicles is so important. You ever have those moments in life where you're just kind of wondering where God is sitting? dry moments, you know, if you've been a Christian for, for long, or if you've been a believer for very long, you know that you kind of start off the journey on full turbos, and you're like, oh, what the Lord is done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, oh my goodness, I traveled And then about a year and a half, two years later, you're kind of like, oh, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Five years later, you're like, he's still good. Seven years later, sometimes you go through some stuff, you're like, I wonder if the Lord is good. There's moments where you get into these Pauses. And what the Chronicler was talking about and why they wrote the way they did was to remind the people of what God did in the past 
because he's still the same God of yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it for you in the past, he's going to do it for you again. Don't lose hope. Stay solid in your faith. Understand he's at work in your life right now, even as you're sitting here tonight. I want you to know that God is building you into the person he desires you to be because he's got something for you in the future. I remember in 1998 when I was at Bible College in Minneapolis, my dad made the phone call and said, you want to come and be a youth pastor in Becker, Minnesota? And I said, I don't, think, I don't think so, man. I'm 19 years old. There's nobody that's going to take me seriously. I mean, a senior in high school is 18, right? If I am a youth pastor, I'm 19. So much wisdom. I remember the moment I said, yeah. When I felt like God was leading me into youth ministry, that set off in between 10 and 11 years of unbelievable, unbelievable movements of God. And I'm so thankful that he did that for me then because if, if, I, if I wouldn't have heard his voice and engaged in the mission and seen what he did then, I would have never known how to be part of this today. You see, sometimes we need to look at the past. What has God done in our lives in the past because he's preparing you for your future? You know what I love about this too? It doesn't matter how old you are. Some people in the room tonight, they're like, you know, like two. And some people in the room tonight, you're like almost 200, you know what I mean? There's a lot of wisdom in this room. And I want you to know whether you're two or 200, that if you're still alive, your mission is still rolling out. Which means this, he's still building you. What has God done in your past that you can look at and say, Woo-wee, look what he did there. I can't wait for what he's got coming up around the corner. Yeah. God is working on us. And that's the entire reason why Chronicles was written. To remind the people of the faithfulness of their God. The time period of God was in between 1,000 and 586 B.C. And what it covers is David and Solomon's reign to the destruction of Israel. Or Jerusalem, sorry. So here's a key verse. If you're going to fly over these books at 30,000 feet, here's a key verse that will kind of give you an idea of what these are all about. First Kings 9, 4 through 7 says, If you will follow me with integrity and godliness, as David your father may obey all my commands, decrees, and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty over Israel forever. For I made this promise to you, David. One of your descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel. But if you and your descendants abandon me, and disobey the commands and decrees I have given you. And if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot Israel from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honor my name. And I will make Israel an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. We need to do is we need to pause on this passage of scripture for a minute. Because we know that one of Solomon's biggest achievements was building the temple. So, with that being said, are you ready for some big boy food tonight? Are you ready for a full course meal? Are you ready for some meat? Do you have that carnivorous craving tonight? The step above, the cut above. I mean, baby food is baby food, but we're about to jump into some meat. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you into a little bit of meat tonight that I think is it's important that we camp out on with this passage of scripture. You see, Solomon's greatest achievement was building the temple. I brought a picture of Solomon's temple that he built, so you got to get an idea of, on what this is. Because for many of you tonight, this is the first time you've actually probably seen something like this out of scripture. And I want you to understand that this happened in the Old Testament. And it's important to catch this so that we understand what happens in the New Testament. Are you still with me? So Solomon builds the temple. The temple is a place that when people were walking by it, they understood that that's where God dwelt. They knew that the tangible presence of God was in the temple. You couldn't walk by the temple without saying, oh, that's God's house. And Solomon spent an amazing amount of time and money and energy on this because he wanted it to just be chef's you know? Now, I brought a picture of what's on the inside of the temple because we've got to get this in our hearts tonight in order to understand what really happened. So on the inside, I love, I love this. 
This is so easy. Here we go. On the inside, when you walked in, there was a lampstand. The lampstand, when they lit it, lit the entire area up. And what that represented was that represented the presence of God, the light of the world. The, uh, the, the oil that ran through the lampstands, it symbolized the anointing upon our lives that only comes from God himself. We can't find it without him. And then the lampstands also represent that God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's what was on the inside of the stamp. Now hold on, it gets better, folks. Check this out. Then you've got the table of showbread. And what the table of showbread is, A, it makes you hungry for that Texas Roadhouse showbread with that honey butter. You know what I'm saying? I think they probably had a little honey butter sitting right next to it. And here's what it was at the table of showbread. The table of showbread had 12 pieces of unleavened bread, but it was stacked in two stacks of six. And what it symbolized, it symbolized the provision from God to his people. However, it also symbolized that God provides for each and every single one of us spiritually. When you saw the showbread, you're like, oh, we can about to eat. You ever left this place on a Wednesday night and you felt like you just ate at a full course of faith and you feel just spiritually stuffed, just ready for the day? That's what these guys got to experience. And then there's this amazing other place called the Altar of Incense that's there, right before you walk through the veil. I love the Altar of Incense. This is amazing. Listen to the symbolism. Well, what happened is the priest was going and they, they'd light it up. And you know what that represented? That represented the prayers of the people. And what that place would do is it would smell of the aroma of the prayers of the people to God. I wonder if people, when they get out in our parking lot, I wonder if they can already smell the prayers that have already gone forth for them. I wonder if there's an aroma when you walk into this building, an aroma where when you walk in, you're like, oh man, the, the Spirit of God is in this place. The prayers of the people have filled the rows. Every seat has been touched by somebody praying for you. I want you to know that when you sat down, incense went up of the prayers that went to God. Yeah. If you can see it through spiritual eyes tonight, it would look like this. And that prayer would just go right up. God is after you. And the priest would like this. Then there was this veil. Now, this is where it gets pretty intense. Because only the high priest was able to walk through the veil into the Holy of Holies. Now check this out. In the Holy of Holies, there was the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God and inside the Ark of the Covenant, there were the Ten Commandments, there was Aaron's staff, and there was uh, a, a piece of manna, which was bread that God provided for the Israelites as they were going through the wilderness. Y'all remember that story we talked about a while back? All right. If the high priest was moving into that place, there was a preparation process. And here's what they would do. They would put bells around the bottom of whatever the high priest was wearing. And then they tied a rope around the high priest's leg. Now listen, if the high priest had sin in his life as he passed through the veil into where God dwelt, that high priest would drop dead. <coughs> and the bells would go ding, ding, ding. It was at that moment that the priest would pull the high priest back through the veil because he could not enter the presence of God like that. Now, uh, 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 if it was still like that today, y'all, I would not be your pastor. <laughs> uh, you're on your own. You sign up for that job. All right. Why is this so good? Well, here you go. This is what Solomon built in the Old Testament. This is the temple in the Old Testament. But then we get to Matthew chapter 27. Verse 50, listen to this. It says, And Jesus, he was on the cross, cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now check this out. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks split. 
You see, what happened in the New Testament when Jesus died, that veil literally split in half. Now, if people were around the temple when that happened, they would have taken off running going, Oh no, God's going to get out. Because they knew how it was set up. But when the veil tore, that was symbolic that it was through Jesus Christ that we all now have access to the Holy of Holies, to God Himself. We don't need a mediator. You don't need someone on your behalf to say, well, just bring your sins to me and I'll talk to the Lord. No, you get to go right to God and say, hey God, here I am, you see me as I am. And you get to say, will you forgive me? Will you, will you give me my mission? Can I be part of what you are doing? You see, we have full access to God himself. So this is what this means. In the Old Testament, Solomon was entrusted to build a temple, which was a tangible place where God dwelt. Now check this out. Who do you think the temple is today? Every believer that's sitting in this room, you're the temple. Now it's your, your relevance. Now it's your full access. Now it's your provision that you get to see up close and personal. No priest entering on your behalf. You get to experience it. I can tell you that that has changed my life. Understanding that God has built me into his temple. That God has built you into his temple as a believer. I think that that is absolutely life changing. So what does this mean? Well, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, it says this. Don't you realize that all, of, all together... That all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. You see, when God made us his temple, he made us a unique body. You can tell the person sitting next to you, you're unique. Some guy have way too much fun with that. You're unique. What does it mean to be unique? What does it mean to be the temple of God? Well, here's a few ideas. God is good. If God is good, guess who else is good? We are. God is merciful. If God is merciful, guess who else is merciful? We are. God is loyal. And don't you just love the fact that God is loyal? There's a difference between a loyal person and a non-loyal person. You know what I'm saying? God is loyal. And if God is loyal, guess who else is loyal? We are. God is grace filled. Anybody excited that you got the grace of God flowing through your veins tonight? Amen. And if God is grace filled, guess who else is grace filled? We are. Amen. God is compassionate. You meet compassionate people, you love being around compassionate people. Why? Because they see beyond your sin. Yeah. If God is compassionate, guess who else is compassionate? We are. God is generous. I love the fact you got the generous God up in the building. A generous God that says, hey, you know what? Just gather together and see what I do tonight. A generous God that tomorrow when you go to work, just keep on loving me and see what happens. A generous God that when we gather with our families on the weekends, a God that says, just be generous with each other and see what happens. Don't you think for a generous God? If God's generous, so. Solomon built an amazing temple. However, he forgot about the amazing God who gave him the instructions. In 1 Kings 11, 6 it says, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine to Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another to Moab, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all of his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing their gods. You see, what happened is Solomon forgot his God. And here's what this set off. This set off Amazing movement where other kings did exactly what Solomon did. Forgot who God was. So here's the big idea. The big idea is this, that the failure, there is failure in human beings. That's why we need a better king. That's why we need a better king. There is one king, his name is Jesus Christ. And we need him desperately. So I brought a picture of the bad kings that happened after Solomon and the good kings. Check this out. All of the bad kings are named in gray. All of the good kings are named in blue. 
Can you see that the gray outnumbers the blue? What happens is corruption always destroys a nation. And year after year after year after year, there were kings that were corrupt and took down what God decided to build. I think that we can probably take a lesson from this. If you look at the blue, all of the blue are the kings that were good and followed God. And if you follow their stories in scripture, what you see is when a good king did what a good God desired, good things happened. And even today, I want you to understand this is true for you and I. If we just continue to do what God asks us to do, good things will happen. That's why we must pray for our nation. That's why we need to pray for the leaders that are in office. That's why we need to pray for the leaders that might take office. Why? Because good kings do good things because of the good God. But if you forget about a good God, you've now lost the favor of God on your life and your nation struggles. And that's exactly what happened over and over and over again. And this is the big takeaway that I took, took away from studying the books. First and second kings. The big idea is that human beings can worship false gods and think it's right. Human beings can worship false gods and think it's right. And that's what happened over and over and over with these people. Let's just do it a little different than the way that King David did. Tweak this and tweak that. I know that God said to do it this way, but let's get away with this. How about we try this? What was it? They begin to worship false idols. They begin to worship self. They begin to worship the gods of the day. They, they begin to worship the idols. Why? Because they thought it was right. But I want you to know that it's dangerous when we think a false idol is right. It doesn't take very long to find out what the idols are in the world today. Money. So many worship. Self. So many worship self. Today I went to build some crackers down the road and I looked and there was the self checkout and then there was the checkout with the person there. There were two people in front of me and I thought, now I could blow right through this tonight and I could self checkout myself. But you know what? God called me to be around people. So I waited in line, even though self-checkout was ready to rock. And I went through the line and I said to her, I said, now, I could have done self-check, but I chose you check. Because you're a person and I like people. And then I said this, it's almost like you see a lot of self today, isn't it? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> You see, it's, it's about knowing our mission and who called us to it. Worshiping the God, the King of Kings, who placed us in this city. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to wrap this up and land the plane with just a, an amazing story that I found in 1 Kings that I think needs to be highlighted. And here it is. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 19 through 40. This is called the Mount Carmel Experience. This is a pre before you tonight, it's not in your notes. This is called the Mount Carmel Experience. Now let me tell you what the Mount Carmel Experience was. It was about a prophet named Elijah, which is one of the most amazing prophets in scripture. What he does is he tells the king of the day, Ahab, to go ahead and gather the 450 prophets of Baal, the false god, and gather 400 prophets of the false god, Asherah. Elijah said, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to all be on Mount Carmel, and we're going to have a God off. We're going to see who God really is, who's, whose God is real. And so they all meet at the Mount Carmel experience, and, and it's funny because the worshipers of Baal begin to cry out to Baal, and, and Elijah actually says, hey, maybe you need to be louder. Maybe your God doesn't hear you. And then the false, the, the prophets of the false god Asher were crying out to their god, and, and Elijah actually said, maybe your god is on vacation. And then he actually said this to the Bible. He said, or maybe your god is relieving themselves right now. That's my kind of guy. 
And so they had the, the altar of Baal and, and the slaughtered bull, and then they had the altar of Asherah and the slaughtered bull on there. And then there's Elijah. And, and Elijah, you know, he takes his stuff and he's building his altar and he's putting it all together. And he takes like three gallons of water, dumps it over all the wood and, and the, the bowl. And then there's a trench that was actually around the, uh, the altar that had about three gallons of water that was in it. And here's what happened. Elijah stood, both the prophets worshiping their false gods, and said, God, the Bible says that fire fell from heaven and consumed Elijah's altar and it just absolutely showed who the real king of kings is. Listen, we know that scripture is 100% right 100% of the time. If Elijah had a God off and the God of the, of the earth, the creator of the universe answered, we know that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever and we are on the right team. Team Jesus. There will be many things that try to get your time and get your attention. But always pay attention to what Jesus is saying to you because Jesus is coming and he is our better king. That's it in no sense. Matthew chapter 21, 1, 1 through 9 says this. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to the Bethphage of Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find a donkey's eye and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone sends to you, you shall say this, the Lord has need for them, and immediately he will send for them. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought a donkey and a colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before, those who followed, cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the word Hosanna means this, save now. Who do you need in your neighborhood to be saved? Who in your family right now is in desperate need of Jesus? Hosanna. Hosanna. We call on the God who's alive. We call on Jesus Christ who is seated at the right, right hand of God right now. Last, last week we studied on how he went to the cross. Well, this week we study on how he's alive. Hosanna. So what I want to do is I want to apply this so that when we leave here, we leave here with some handles. Here we go. Cuban kings represent economies, governments, armies, political and educational financial systems, human kings will always fail us. They will. Only Jesus can truly save now. Maybe you're in this room and you've never made Jesus the leader of your life. Maybe you're sitting there going, Pastor Kevin, I'm, I'm not a believer. Did you know the scripture says going from unbeliever to believer is simple. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, help me out, saved. Saved from what? Self. Saved from what else? Sin. Saved from hell. So if that's you, you're like, yeah, you know what? I think that it sounds like a pretty good deal. I'd like to do that. Just say something like this. Jesus, right now I give you my life. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you came to this earth. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the grave. I believe that you ascended into heaven. And I believe that you made a promise that you'll be back one day. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. Even my heart that God raised you from the dead, and I know I will be with you that day. That's just following the prompting of the Spirit of God in your life. That's all that is. If you made that, that decision, that choice tonight, walk with Jesus. Romans 8 38 39 says this For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to 
separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the few moments that we had tonight just to slow down, to stop, and to receive. I pray that when we leave this place, we leave with the transforming power of Scripture alive in our being. I pray that as we leave this place tonight, we leave this place with our eyes fixed on you. I believe that when we leave this place tonight, Jesus, we will leave with a new confidence that we are forgiven and set free from sin. And I pray, Father God, that we continue to see you move throughout this week in ways that we could have never imagined. I pray a very special blessing over every family in this room. Thank you so much for what you're doing in the lives of your people. Thank you for what you're doing right here in Becker and the surrounding areas. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. And we give you all the praise. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. At the end of every single service, we always do a blessing verse. So we leave you leave with the blessing of God in your life. You have to understand and we're going to read Psalms chapter 67, verses 1 and 2 together. Let's read it. God, be gracious to us and bless us, and may his face shine upon us, that his way may be known on earth, his saving power 